Okay, so welcome along, ladies and gentlemen, to your weekly SETI seminar series. Uh, tonight we're very, very honoured to be uh, joined by Jim Head, who's come across to us from the East Coast. Uh, Jim uh, did a BS in uh, geology from uh, Washington and Lee, and then uh, did his PhD uh, in geological sciences at Brown University uh, in uh, carbonate de depositional systems in uh, the Appalachians. Uh, and then uh, he spent four years uh, in Washington, D.C., working at Belcom Incorporated, uh, and during which time he uh, became interested in uh, NASA uh, and uh, was and in planetary geology uh, relating to the Apollo lunar exploration programs uh, and he got involved in training the Apollo astronauts uh, at that time. Uh, after that he was uh, interim director in Houston of the Lunar Science Institute uh, and then he returned to Brown in uh, 1973 as an assistant professor uh, and uh, since then has uh, been appointed the James Manning Chair in 1990, uh, and then since 1995 he has been the uh, Lewis and Elizabeth Shirk Professor in Geological Sciences. Uh, Jim has, uh, since 1984, been uh, co-convening the uh, brown Vedansky Micro Symposium before Lunar and Planetary Science Institute each year. Uh, he is currently supervising uh, eight graduate students, uh, and uh, many more uh, are in uh, the planetary sciences field now as as full researchers. Uh, he is a fellow of the Geological Society of America, the uh, American Geological, uh, the American Geophysical oh. Union, uh, the American Amer Association for the Advancement of, of uh, Science, and uh, the Meteoritical Society. Uh, Jim's uh, work uh, revolves around a, a, a wide variety of uh, interests. Um, he's currently, for example, using fieldwork in the Antarctic to inform his uh, Mars uh, and uh, terrestrial planets research. Uh, he is also a co-I on uh, the messenger mission to Mercury, uh, on Mars, Mars, Mars Express, the European mission, uh, and uh, and he is also uh, also uh, an advocate for gl recent glaciation uh, on Mars and evidence for that uh, in the Amazonian period. Uh, and also uh, global evolution of uh, Venus. So I think uh, today we're going to hear about all those worlds uh, and all those terrestrial planets um, from Jim. So if you'll join me in welcoming Jim. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I'm over at Ames, actually, for the uh, NASA Lunar Science Institute, Lunar Science Forum, a really excellent meeting where we're bringing together people with all different disciplines uh, to talk about the future of exploration, both from a scientific and a human and robotic standpoint. So it's very exciting, and it's great to be here at SETI as well, because, of course, uh, SETI is dedicated to asking and helping to answer the questions that are on all our minds. So thank you very much. So I'd like to talk to you today about essentially looking at the geology of the terrestrial planets. It's really a fascinating area. You know, we've come so long and so far in just a few short decades. It's really amazing, short to me anyway. Um, uh, and I w would like to try to share to you with you some of that journey and put into perspective some of the things that we've learned about our own home planet Earth from our sojourn, if you will, over the last few decades uh, into the solar system and beyond. So I think one of the critical things we can think about is two parallel revolutions that have taken place in the last 50 years or so, maybe 50 to 60 years. The first one was what was really a revolution in our understanding of our own home planet Earth. And this came about through a process that is familiar to most of you, I think, in the context of plate tectonics, okay? When I was an undergraduate at Washington University uh, in the early 60s, uh, we didn't know about plate tectonics. We sat around and I can remember sitting in my professor's office um, looking at uh, the dip of the earthquake zones, known as Benioff zones, under the uh, South American continent and just puzzling at what's going on, looking at the brief outlines of uh, the seafloor and thinking about, you know, how old is it? They're digging up some really young rocks. What's going on out there? And uh, before too long, of course, the information came together from a variety of different standpoints and showed that the Earth is, in fact, dominated by a global tectonic system. And I'm going to point to this one because I'm left-handed. I'm sorry if it's going to be inconvenient. But basically, the Earth is made up 
of a whole series of laterally moving lithospheric plates. Crust is created at the divergent plate boundaries at the um, places like uh, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. It moves laterally at relatively high rates, you know, basically faster than your fingernails are growing. That's another little cocktail tidbit next time you want to use that. <clears throat> and in fact, it's not changing airfares anywhere, but you put it over geological time and it, it works, okay? <laughs> but the point is, this is moving apart. Continents are getting a free ride, the more ancient parts of the Earth's surface, etc. And then, of course, it's a sphere, so it has to come together somewhere else. It does, it kind of battles out for density, uh, and then something subducts, that it's just simply thrust under another plate. So that's the basic system. That's a plate tectonic system. And it took a long time uh, to come to grips and understand that, and people fought it for years. It's a wonderful thing to watch after, you know, the kind of thing. Uh, became pretty much <coughs> dominant in the, in the field. You know, there's still a lot of discussion about it, as there should be. So this was the revolution uh, in the 1960s, late 50s, 60s, and early 70s. It really changed our perspective about our own home planet. So that's great news. I just came back from two weeks in Iceland. I mean, standing on a huge upwelling hotspot right at the divergent plate boundary. I mean, I'm a geologist. They have volcanoes, they have earthquakes, they have glaciers, they have volcanoes interacting with glaciers. I mean, you know, you can't go wrong there, okay? <laughs> so it's really exciting, and that's the good news. You can actually go out and watch it happen, okay? Now, the bad news is <laughs> it's so active that it's really doing two things to destroy the record. The first part of it is that it's just erosional. You know, we, you, know you, uh, you just get a lot of rain, you get a lot of erosion, it erodes the rocks away, sends them to the ocean, and then the plates are so active that they really resurface the surface very fast. So two-thirds of the surface of the Earth, the ocean basins are less than 200 million years old, and that's less than just a couple of percent of the history of the Earth. Imagine that. Two-thirds of the planet is really young. <clears throat> so. <clears throat> That's great, we can see how it forms, etc. But the problem is, when did plate tectonics start? How and when did the continents form, okay? And, you know, what was the early atmosphere like? And why and where did life originate? All these fundamental questions are not within our grasp anymore because two-thirds of the surface, uh, uh, you know, more than, more than half of this uh, geological record of the Earth has been, in fact, destroyed. So if we pretend, I said I was going to do this on the left, but I'm going to, obviously, I can't stand still, so... Um, if, you, if you pretend that this is a clock at the origin of the Earth and working around to the present day, okay, so that's beginning all the way around at 12 o'clock, and you pretend that, you know, you map out the surface uh, age of the, uh, of, of the portions of the Earth that we can see, this is the 200 million years. This is the 30, 60% uh, that's, in fact, ocean basins, okay? That's the vast majority of the Earth. And the geological record we have from earlier than that is... is Excellent, okay, we can look at the continents, we can look at this sort of thing and understand it, but really the first half of solar system history is just simply uh, very underrepresented or just simply not there. So if I wanted to understand one of you all, I would ask, you know, what was going on in your childhood? What kind of, where were you brought up? What was your culture? How did you, in fact, did you have a, did you have a <laughs> traumatic experience or something like that that shaped your worldview and so on? Unfortunately for the Earth, those formative years chapters, the first 10 chapters in a 20-chapter book, are gone, okay? So that's, that's not good news when we want to understand how the Earth formed, where it's going, where it's been, etc., okay? So we, what we need is um, an understanding of the major processes operating in the first half of Earth history. This is really critical. Now, of course, lurking behind this tree is part of the answer to that, okay? That is um, the moon. So where's the record of the major processes operating in the first half of the solar system history? Okay, the planets and moons were soon to join Earth, if you will, uh, in, at about this time as objects of geological interest and analysis. Geological interest and analysis. We'll see that largely at this point they're, in fact, astronomical objects. People are looking through telescopes, making critical observations, uh, but they were astronomical objects, not necessarily geological objects. So at this point, um, <clears throat> began a, a really incredible period of time, and this was the comparative planetology view of things. How do we look at the Earth? How can we learn from the other planets about the Earth history? What are the other planets informing us about the nature and evolution uh, of the solar system and how planets work, etc.? So this was really exciting, and of course it all started out with this thing. I don't know whether anybody ever recollects this signal or not. Oh, good. Thank God. <laughs> okay. <laughs> When I was in the <clears throat> when I was in high school, um, I uh, had a uh, Hallicrafters radio. One of the big gifts to me from my parents was a. It'll stop. Trust me. It's, 
that's going around in orbit. <coughs> um, a shortwave radio. <coughs> Excuse me. It cost uh, $50, which was a huge amount of money at the time. And that was my, for those of you younger people in the audience, that was my internet, okay? Basically, I could communicate, um, w you know, I could listen. I didn't have transmission capability, but I could listen to all sorts of things um, in different parts of the world, particularly late at night on cold nights, et cetera. I learned a little physics in the process and so on. And uh, this was incredible, okay? So um, uh, what, I, what I learned was that, uh, you know, when this, this thing was launched, that I could actually tune into it on the radio, okay? And I ended up um, asking, um, listening to the radio one time, and as you might expect, one of the strongest signals I could get was none other than Radio Moscow, okay? So uh, this is the Cold War, okay? They knew what they were doing. And so I had my little radio, I was listening to Radio Moscow, and it said, you know, if you would like to know when Sputnik is coming over your house, um, uh, send us a, uh, you know, send us your address and we'll send you the information. So, you know, I got my little allowance together, bought a bunch of stamps and sent this thing off to Radio Moscow USSR and waited every day um, for uh, the answer. I kept running home. There's a little table where the mail was, uh, was put in. Uh, so I came running home and one day I came up and here was this incredible envelope with all these Soviet space stamps on it. And uh, I'm going, oh my God. I looked up and there's my aunt looking down <laughs> Not very uh, appreciatively, and um, this is when I learned she worked at the CIA, okay, so, <laughs> so uh, she was sure I was never going to get a security clearance or anything like that, uh, and, uh, and she might have been right uh, for a while, I don't know, but, but, uh, but the critical thing was that, um, in fact, that, um, you know, it actually, as a quick aside, all of a sudden it made sense to me. When we would go on the beach vacation, she would ask me to sit under the boardwalk with her and review flashcards, which on the one side had Chinese um, uh, text, and on the other side had things like tanks and bridges and airplanes and things like that. And uh, you know, I wondered at the time, what the hell is going on here? You know, and it turns out that of course she was. Uh, this is before the Chinese came over the Yalu River, and uh, she was making the maps. She, you know, they knew they were coming, and you know, she was making the maps to, for the uh, to defense, etc. Anyway. Those were the days, okay? So this really changed everything, okay? It made me personally look up into space because I'd been, you know, futzing around, collecting rocks, doing this sort of thing, always looking down, you know? Uh, and, oh my God, you know, this is really incredible. So this is a formative change for me. And in fact, this launched uh, a 50 plus years of space exploration that have just been unbelievable, okay? Just unbelievable. So let me give you let, let me have my life flash before your eyes here, okay, as we just quickly walk through what's going on here. Sputnik, I mean, this, this is a long time ago, okay? Explorer 1, Mariner 2 to Venus, okay, 1962, a very important mission. Ranger 7, okay, what happened to Ranger 1 through 6? <sighs> yeah. You know, the tr any of you who were alive at this time remember, okay, we couldn't hit the damn moon, okay? We could not hit the moon, okay? So this is a problem. So it, an inauspicious start, but it, it kept going on. Mariner 4 to Mars. I was out working in the Appalachians uh, in West Virginia, looking at uh, rocks and things like that, and I heard on the radio that, in fact, Mariner 4 data were coming in that afternoon. So I raced back to the motel I was staying and turned on the television, and, uh, you know, I mean, Mars, what the hell does that look like? So, I, you know, the pictures came in, and they had this, like, big broadcast, and a professor from Caltech was there to uh, explain what was going on, and I thought, oh my gosh, this is really interesting. I wonder what the geology of Mars looks like. And so the commentator turned to the professor and said, so what is it? Um, what is the main thing you're interested in here? What's the big problem that you're trying to solve? And the professor, who was not a geoscientist and had designed the instrument and done a wonderful job at that, but didn't have a clue what the pictures meant, <laughs> turned to him and said, you know, the biggest problem we're facing is what to name the craters. I, thought, <laughs> I picked up my hammer and went back out in the field. I said, this, this field is not for me. I mean, I don't, you know. Uh, but interestingly, uh, it all worked out. So Surveyor 1, okay, after that, I'm still in graduate school at this point. Uh, lunar Orbiter 1966. And then... Uh, something happened. A professor at Brown, Tim Much, got us interested in looking over the horizon and talked to us about um, the fact that it would be really interesting to look at the geology of the planet. So he hooked us, basically, myself and, and, and two colleagues in that class. And uh, so uh, I 
he went off on sabbatical, and um, and then I was looking for a job, and I looked at the um, college placement annual, okay, which is a, you guys won't know what that is, but for those of you my age, it's a book, okay, which, okay, <laughs> and instead of going online to figure out where the jobs are, you you know, you, there's this book, so I went to the back, I looked geology, it's page 15 to 22 and 47, I, 47, what's this outlier, you know, what's going on here, so went to page 47, this is what it looked like, okay, picture the moon, our job is to think our way to the moon and back. I said, oh my God, how do you do that? There's a little phone number down here in the corner. It turned out to be NASA headquarters. And um, I applied for the job and I got it. So my first job out of grad school was working in astronaut training, site selection for the Apollo program, and mission operations. And so it was just amazing, I mean, just being there at the right time. So, you know, all of this is kind of converging, okay? It's not just about naming things. You can actually go there with humans and help them understand and train them, etc. So it was really, really exciting. So I worked throughout all the Apollo missions, and um, it was just absolutely fantastic. We learned a huge amount, which I'll get to in a few minutes. Mariner and I to Mars, Mariner 10 to Mercury, okay? Viking to Mars, an incredible mission we worked on in, uh, out of JPL, etc. Voyager, all the way through the solar system, absolutely fantastic. The Soviets were really moving along. They had huge success on Venus. Look at this, landing on the surface of Venus and actually getting pictures back. I mean, just unbelievable technological achievements. Venera 14, uh, we came to work with the Soviets uh, on these missions, etc. cetera. Uh, Venera 15, 16, I got a call from my Soviet colleagues saying, Jim, we have good news and bad news. The good news is you've been named an investigator on Venera 15, 16, the first American investigator. Said, wow, that's great, what's the bad news? Jean, you must come to Moscow in February, okay? So <laughs> this is really, and boy, to, <laughs> Another story there, but anyway, so 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 I did, okay, and I I, I went back and tried to find my high school. Uh, you're spending time in Antarctica, you know, you get used to cold. So I went back to try to find my high school uh, overcoat, and oh, I was very proud to dig it out of somewhere. God only knows where it was. And uh, so I get to Moscow, I get off the plane, get through customs and immigration. They take the gene. This coat is not from Moscow, you know. <laughs> so, and and boy, were they right. Okay, so Phobos two, another Soviet mission. Um, Magellan, hugely successful mission to Venus. Uh, again, Galileo, outer planets, uh, looking at the satellites of Jupiter, etc. Clementine around the moon, uh, near on asteroids. Mars Global Surveyor, beginning a campaign of Mars missions. Absolutely fantastic. Mars Pathfinder. Uh, Cassini, still going strong around Saturn. An unbelievable mission. Uh, Stardust returning samples. Genesis as well. Mer rovers. One of them is still working, and of course we're on our way at the present time. Messenger to Mercury. We're, we're in orbit for the second extended, uh, for an extended mission, and we're working on planning the second one. Deep impact, impacting a comet, looking at the ejecta, dawn uh, at the asteroid Vesta, moving on to Ceres in the very near future. So 50 years of space missions, unbelievable. Now this is just a diagram that shows Here's our home planet here. Look at this. Look at these missions going into orbit around here. This is very diagrammatic, but it's all real. And so, in fact, planets change from astronomical objects to geological objects. I mean, we actually sent humans there. This is Dave Scott doing geology on the flanks of the Apennine Mountains at the Hadley Apennine region. I mean, unbelievable, okay. Six times, humans, field studies on the moon. So these two different um, themes, uh, understanding the Earth and the planets really came together and comparative planetology was born. Well, what were the kind of things we were interested in? What were we trying to figure out, okay? These are the kind of questions that comparative planetology allowed us to ask. How are planets formed, okay? What's their density and internal structure? Clearly, if we take a look at this diagram, which shows the position of the planets in the solar system, their size, their density, and the presence or absence of an atmosphere, and this will come back from time to time, you can see these bars are going all over the place, okay? So there's variations in density, variations in size. It's like a huge experiment that has been performed, and you're trying to figure out what happened, okay? But you, it's not just one data point. You've got a lot of data points. So that's really, really exciting. Uh, how do they gain and lose heat? This is really important. It sounds very simple, but how do they get heat, and then how do they get rid of it? This is the key to planetary evolution, actually. How do they, get, they gain, evolve, and retain atmospheres? You have to start with an atmosphere. You have to build it up somehow. Uh, how does it evolve? Okay, I mean, we, we, we're so used to these kinds of things, and the kind of thing we talk about with global warming is a trivial but very significant change in the overall evolution of the atmosphere. It may sound like an oxymoron to you, but it's true. You know, I mean, if you want an atmospheric change, I can show you atmospheric changes. 
you know, global warming is critically important for us to understand, but it's minor compared to what's happening in the Earth, okay, and other planets. How do they retain atmosphere? What do you mean retain? They go away? Yes, they go away, okay? Okay, so this is, these are the kind of questions. What are the basic stages in the planet's evolution? This is really important, too. If we think about this, um, we can also ask, how do they compare to each other? How do they evolve together in a system? And what environmental conditions are most conducive to life? This is critical. You know, you look around the room, you know, life is incredible, it's very variable. How do we end up actually understanding something about the origins of life? This is what this institute is all about, and it's just a critical question. And so the planets offer us an opportunity with all these variations to really try to get at that as well. So let's take a look at how we approach these kind of things. And I'm going to focus on the innermost or terrestrial planets. This is not to scale, by the way, of course. <laughs> I mean, it's in scale in terms of the size of the planetary bodies, but not their position. So I'm going to focus on the inner terrestrial planets, okay, the Earth-like planets. That's why they're called terrestrial. Uh, and indeed, you can see to a first order, there's a fundamental difference between these planetary bodies. They're small, they're solid rock, uh, compared to the extremely large, gas-rich uh, gas giants in the outer solar system. We'll come back to why that is in just a minute. But we can look at the question of how they vary in terms of their position in the solar system. This is Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars in the inner planets. Uh, you know, we can also think about maybe starting conditions, okay? Maybe when the planets formed in a collapsing solar nebula, okay, the temperature pressure conditions might have been really hot um, and high pressure near the sun and less so in the exterior. This could explain, for example, the fundamental difference between how gases accumulated out here but didn't accumulate in here. You have kind of burnt out residue, uh, the more refractory or uh, resistant to heat elements uh, in the inner part, and then the more gas-rich things in the exterior. We can also ask that same question for these planetary bodies. Is there a theme here between the uh, characteristics of Mercury to Venus to Earth to, to Mars in that same context? So we can look at it in terms of position. We can also look at it in terms of size. What does size have to do with planetary evolution? This is kind of critical, actually, when we think about this, because you take a look here. The Earth and Venus are about the same size. The Moon is one quarter of the diameter. Uh, Mercury is a third, and Mars is one half. So, hey, a built-in laboratory for the study of the importance of size in the evolution of planets, okay? So, um, let's start with the Moon and work our way through the solar system in a kind of a warp drive view of solar system evolution, okay? We'll try to keep it below seven, so to speak, for you Star Trek fans, and we'll have no core meltdown here. Um, so, what about the Moon? It's one quarter the diameter of the Earth. Let me go back to this a second. It's one quarter the diameter of the Earth. Its density is a little over three. It does not have an atmosphere, and it's in the same position as the, as, as the Earth, okay? So in terms of planetary position. Now, of course, we know so much about the Moon because of the Cold War. You know, I always tell my students, don't, you know, don't start a war just to you know, enhance science. But truthfully, every time we have some situation like that, there are great advancements in technology, et cetera. And of course, it was a space race that got us where we are uh, uh, today. So this is just portraying, if you will, some of the memorabilia that comes with this. Uh, in fact, I collect these things and uh, just as a kind of a historical thing. And you know, you look at all these Soviet um, events that happened here that were incredibly successful. Uh, landings on the surface, orbiters, little cars that drove around on the surface of the moon. The Soviets actually, you may not know this, returned samples robotically from the moon three times. 40 some years ago, okay? Something we're still struggling to do today in the US, okay? Um, so all of that went on. There was a huge context of the space race. This is what propelled us. This is why Apollo existed. Uh, and in fact, it ended up with uh, a, a successful deployment of astronauts onto the surface of the moon. I want to focus on Dave Scott here, uh, who was the Apollo 15 commander, because he's symptomatic of the drive of these, some, you know, I, students at Brown and my students are just absolutely fantastic. Um, Dave Scott and the astronauts were also extremely highly motivated and really excellent, okay? So they're, they're just amazing people. And what I want to show you here is the three periods of extravehicular activity that Dave Scott, Jim Irwin spent on the surface world. Al Warden was in orbit, uh, making other measurements. They went to the edge of, uh, of the mountains. They went to the edge of Hadley Rill. Uh, they discovered a whole series of things in this area here on the moon, including what was dubbed at the time the Genesis Rock, a rock over four billion years old, uh, which in fact was what um, we were looking for there, okay? So Dave was um, trained, um, among others, uh, to look for evidence of deep crustal material. That's why they went to the edge of this huge impact basin. 
And from probably 10, 15 meters from this particular rock that you're looking at there on the lower right, Dave looked across and he said, Houston, I think we found what we came for. Because he recognized in this the shiny twinning that occurs in a, a mineral called plagioclase felspar that he'd, you know, he'd been trained to, uh, to see in classrooms and discussions in the field, et cetera. And he spotted that from 10 meters away on the moon and said, I found it. And this was it indeed. It was dubbed the Genesis rock and it's told us so much about the internal structure of the moon, the nature of the crust and its evolution. Now there were six landings on the moon and in fact this is one of the things we're working on here with the NASA Lunar Science Institute. Uh, our particular part of that is the Brown MIT uh, cooperative effort. Uh, and one of the things that we're doing is actually having the astronauts, particularly Dave Scott and his colleagues, come back and work with our students now in replanning new missions to the moon. Okay, we're working with MIT uh, and Brown to, uh, to, to, to plan these kinds of things and build on the structure uh, that was uh, formulated by, in fact, the planning and the results of the multiple Apollo missions. Absolutely fantastic, okay? So what did we learn? Well, we got rocks back from the moon, okay? Very exciting. A whole series of things we could see, uh, details on how impact cratering works and breaches and so on. These are the maria, which are volcanic lava flows um, in the central part here. And these, the highland regions, are extremely ancient crust uh, that formed in the first few hundreds of millions of years of the history of the solar system. And the lunar crust gives us ideas about how these early crusts form. And how do they form? They form from impact cratering. Huge impacts come together multiple times, melt the outer part of the planet, and it segregates out, like you know, when you're making soup and you have a scum on the top. Some of the minerals, like plagioclase, under these conditions will float up to the top, create a crust, some of it sinks, and so on. This is how we learn what the Earth's formative years was like. We have the rock types. Believe it or not, I actually have these in my freshman class, where we have, from NASA, um, thin sections of rocks from the moon from all the Apollo missions, which we actually sit down in freshman class and actually put together the history of the moon, Look at <clears throat> looking at the actual moon rocks. It's your tax dollars at work, so thank you very much for that. <laughs> so the other thing we learned, too, was the ancient age of the surface of the moon. This was really critical. The Maria ranged from 3 to about 3.9 billion years old, and the Highland rocks were much older, as exemplified by the rocks that Dave Scott found and brought back. So what did we learn from the moon? Okay. We learned about the early history of the Earth. We learned how another planetary body worked. We learned how a body one quarter of the diameter of the Earth worked. Absolutely fun, fantastic things. We'll come back to geological maps like this uh, in which we're looking at the moon. This is the near side of the moon. Anything in yellow and brown has to do with impact cratering. The crust that was formed by this, impact ejecta that was formed, etc. And the blue areas are volcanic activity. So to a first order, just looking at this basic geological map, you can see in fact, that moon was dominated by volcanic activity, which was superposed largely on this ancient impact-related crust. So this was big news. So volcanism and impact cratering and early crustal evolution are themes for the formative years of planetary bodies. We could actually take a look at these lava flows, <clears throat> and based on the landings from Apollo, where the astronauts brought back samples that we could date in the lab, we could count the craters on those surfaces, and a colleague, Harry Hesinger, and I have been working for decades <clears throat> dating these things so that we can actually see different lava flows on the surface of the moon and figure out the complete range and the flux, that is the amount of lava that flowed on the surface with time, and map that out. And this is a key. It's sort of like the pulse of the planet, okay? So you can see that the, the younger deposits here are few and far between and they're locally here. So this is the last stages of evolution a couple of billion years ago of the moon's interior. So this is the kind of thing we can read. We can read the pulse of the planet from these kinds of data based on the samples brought back from Apollo. So this list is too long to absorb here, but I just want to highlight a couple of things. I wanted to present the list because this is like the dozen or 11, whatever it is, fundamental things we've learned uh, about the moon, which informs us about other planetary bodies. So ancient ages, OK? Um, I want to point out that we know something from seismic data on the moon about uh, in fact, the interior of the crust, the crust, the lithosphere, the thermal evolution we learn about. We learn how it, it, it underwent its uh, segregation and modification of internal materials. And we also learn that the moon does not have plate tectonics. One of my colleagues, Sean Solomon, dubbed the moon a one-plate planet. It doesn't have multiple plates moving. Because it's so small, it cooled very rapidly, so thick that it couldn't actually subduct into the interior. So it created a single global lithospheric plate. Okay, 
Some might call that boring, okay? <laughs> For us, it preserves the record of that early history. Once you get a one-plate planet, everything that happened on it, you can see. And that's great news, okay? So that's the key character of the moon. It's a one-plate planet which preserves these early events, okay? We also learned that impact cratering was a fundamental process. Well, everybody knows that, okay? So yeah, you look at these astronauts and say, yeah, look, here's another crater. Whoa, big deal. Okay, so this tells us something about the early history as well, because we can count the craters and learn about the chronology. But more importantly, we found that there were some kind of like interesting major events, okay? Here's one of them here. This is a picture of the moon taken by the early lunar orbiter. This is the curvature moon, 1,738 kilometers radius uh, on the moon. And here you can see a 930 kilometer basin, okay, that's pretty much covering one whole hemisphere of the moon. Check it, check it out. There's the basin, there's the ejecta, that's about a hemisphere, okay? One single large impact event resurfaces one half the planet, okay? This is not the biggest one, it's not the only one. There's like 30 to 50 of these things on the moon, dating from the first 600 or so million years of the history of the planet. Do you think that these things could occur on the moon and the Earth was unscathed? <laughs> not likely, okay? Not likely at all. So again, we're learning something. Oh my God, you know, these things, as one of my colleagues, Jerry Wasserberg at Caltech, used to say, yeah, that would really be something to see from the Earth if you had a good bunker. Because, <laughs> you know, believe me, this stuff doesn't just all go back to the moon. It comes to the Earth as well. What we learned was huge amounts of material can be melted. We learned it material can be excavated from the interior of the planet and put out on the surface. And this has guided a lot of our missions since that time uh, to take advantage of these as huge drill holes into the interior of the moon. Now the other thing we find uh, is in fact that that's not the biggest of the events, okay? We can actually learn something. Remember that the Earth's um, uh, time clock here had everything in this area here, but now this from the moon we're learning about that first third to a quarter a uh, quarter to a third of the history of the planets as well. So one of the things we've learned is that actually that's not the biggest impact crater, that in fact early on a planetary body the size of Mars, one half the diameter of the Earth, hit the Earth and that's essentially the prevailing theory for how the Moon formed. Just think about this a second, okay? So this is what we call proto-Earth, okay? Now remember I was talking about traumatic experiences in your childhood. Now, I'm here to tell you that this is a traumatic experience because basically you're taking something one half of the diameter of the planet and impacting it into the planet. And it's thought that the ejecta from this has actually went into orbit around, created Saturn-like rings, and it actually accreted to form the moon. So again, this cannot, the Earth cannot go unscathed from this. So this is brand new insight into the Earth's formative years and how things are going. So that's really interesting, and the moon provides a fundamental cornerstone here. Let's take a look at the next larger body, Mercury. Mercury's a little unusual. It's in towards the sun. Maybe this has something that, you know, it might, it, it's also denser. Check it out here in terms of density. It's the orange one here. It's the same density as the Earth and Venus. And so right away, hmm, something, something's wrong here. There's a variable here we're not taking into account. Maybe it has to do with more siderophile, more stable, um, uh, like iron-rich elements, iron elements, iron-like elements in the inner part of the solar system uh, in the area of the collapsing solar nebula. So this is really interesting. And in Mariner 10, uh, in <clears throat> the 1970s, early 1970s, flew by three times. It's really hard to get into orbit around Mercury because you can imagine you're heading to Mercury and the sun is pulling you in. And just before you get to the sun, you say, let's put on the brakes and go into orbit. And of course, you know, you have to have huge amounts of fuel to do that or be very clever in how you do it. So it flew by three times going around the sun and got some amazing information. Um, it's slightly larger than the moon, one third the diameter of, of the Earth, uh, but it contains a core of lunar size based on the density argument. So, so we're looking at something that has a huge core, a huge core, uh, and, and so what would the surface look like, okay? Would it be something like the Earth with a huge core, or would it look like the moon? Turns out it looked like the moon. The surface was pretty much similar uh, to the surface of the moon with some important variations. It had uh, uh, in impact craters all over the place, so they dominated the surface. A key question was, are the planes of volcanic origin or not? They're smooth planes. They look like they might have been in place as lava flows, but they didn't have the brightness distinction that the lunar maria do. When you look at the lunar maria, you say, that's really different than the highlands. And so, you know, that's one of the reasons we thought they were lava flows. On the other hand, you look at Mercury, 
And you say, those are planes, but it's the same brightness and color, if you will, and maybe composition as the highlands. So we went for 35 years not knowing whether there was actually volcanism on the surface or not. And as a volcanologist, it was really upsetting, okay? We figured out, well, you know, kind of like being volcanic chauvinists, we said, hey, you know, there's no way you can create a planet without volcanism. So we set about trying to think, okay, look, let's, let's try to create a planet without volcanism. Actually, it's pretty easy, okay? You just need a really thick, buoyant crust, and it's really hard to get the magma out, the molten rock out from the interior. <clears throat> so we were very depressed, but I'm here to tell you that the messenger mission has shown volcanism extensively, okay? So my career is, is, uh, is, is saved, if you will. So it has a magnetic field. Is there a core, liquid fluid, uh, convecting? Uh, Mariner 10 raised many questions, uh, many more questions than it answered. We always like to say that because we want another mission, but it was true. <coughs> so Mercury has a lunar-like surface and an Earth-like interior. So the question is, what's the origin of Mercury's huge, co huge core? Does Mercury have crustal magnetic anomalies? Uh, a whole series of questions here. What's the origin of the smooth planes? Does Mercury have volcanism? Really pretty fundamental question. Uh, what is the cause of the global scale contraction? We noticed that Mercury was a lot like the moon, but it had these huge scarps on it, like kilometer high scarps that went hundreds and thousands of kilometers across the surface. And they looked like, almost like proto-subduction, like material was attempting to be pushed down in the interior, but just couldn't get there. So that was very different than the moon. So what was going on there? That's really unusual. Um, and again, uh, a series of questions here which, which were posed and which were attempted to be answered by, in fact, the messenger mission. So one of the things we thought as volcanologists is, okay, now we're going to get this really high resolution set of camera systems and uh, spectrometers, et cetera, into orbit around uh, Mercury, which we did successfully. Uh, and in fact, <clears throat> we thought we're going to see all kinds of things like we see on the other planetary bodies, Olympus, Mons, on Mars, uh, volcanoes and small shields and so on, all kinds of things uh, that represent volcanic activity uh, on the surface of the other planetary bodies, Earth, Moon, uh, Venus, Mars, and so on. But we didn't see any of that. I mean, not only <laughs> did we were not sure about volcanism, but we didn't see any of the things that were like the fingerprints of volcanism, okay? Well, now, why was that, okay? What we found was, in fact, that there were huge expanses of what appeared to be volcanic plains, but they didn't have any of the features associated uh, with extrusive volcanism like we're used to thinking about, okay? Like Iceland is being built up as a large um, area, et cetera. We found when we went into orbit that there was 6% of the surface of the area of Mars, of what planet are we on? Mercury, uh, had a, a whole broad area that it seems to have been flooded at about the same time. 6% of the planet resurfaced over a period of time in which you couldn't see differences in any kind of resurfacing. The crater density was the same all over. Wow, that's, that's pretty impressive. No evidence like shield volcanoes or anything like that, but huge amounts of resurfacing. Um, so you can see the scale of this in, in the context of the United States here, uh, sort of like coast-to-coast -coast volcanism with a little for Canada and a little for Mexico as well. Uh, here it is in reference to the moon. You know, it's, it's at least equal to all the lunar maria. Uh, and so what is the nature and mode of emplacement of, of these kinds of things? Why are they so different? So this is one of the things we've learned is if you take a look at the inner structure of all these planetary bodies, okay, Mercury has a huge core and a very, very thin mantle, okay? So typically what happens <clears throat> when you have heating at the top of the core, you set up convection, okay? It creates convection in the mantle, and this is what produces the kind of plumes that we see underneath for example, uh, Hawaii and underneath Iceland, okay? So they're focused and they're concentrated. But if we take a look at what the cross-section of, um, of Mercury might look like, it might be different. So this is, in fact, the outer boundary layer, uh, a thin convecting, a thick convecting mantle where you have these kinds of hot spots extending up like at Iceland and Hawaii. And on the other hand, when the mantle is really thin, these kinds of convective things are more difficult to start. So a little technical here, but the point is, if you had this thin layer that you're heating up, you heat up the whole layer, you put the uppermost layer in extension, and then the molten lava can come out, just pour out, okay? So this is what we think is going on. The reason we don't see a lot of these kinds of features like we see typically in other places is, you create this huge reservoir of molten rock below, it stresses the outer part, cracks it, and then the lava just comes pouring out, like we see in that 6% of the northern lava. Big surprises, okay? Very different than we would have thought about 
actually very similar to the kind of things that are occasionally seen on the Earth in these large igneous provinces, these huge flood basalts that happen in the northwest of the U.S., in, in India, and other places on the planet. So this may be clues as to what's going on there as well. So this is a big surprise, <clears throat> and this is the key for planetary exploration, is, you know, if you think you know what, you, what you're going to find, you probably don't need to go, but if you, you, actually, if you think you know, you probably don't know, because experience has shown us as one of my colleagues said, as we sit down before the mission, is it going to be A, is it going to be B, is it going to be C? And he would always say, this is Tom Agetchen, a colleague of mine, he would say, don't forget D, none of the above. And typically, <coughs> it turns out to be none of the above. So this is big news for us, and we're now in the primary mission here, okay, uh, finished that up, and now we're in the extended mission, which goes on to March 2013. We're in orbit collecting data, absolutely amazing information. And in fact, um, we're hoping to get another extended mission if NASA has enough money to go for another year. Uh, and we hope the spacecraft lasts that long. Huge testimony to the incredible scientists and engineers who build these things and help to run them. Absolutely amazing. And again, your tax dollars at work, we really thank you for that. But I hope you'll be convinced by the end of this that it's worth uh, the price of a few pennies per year. Okay, so this is important, and let's go on to the next one here, which is Mars. Mars is really amazing. One half the diameter of the Earth. Oh, by the way, you know, it's got an atmosphere here, and it's a CO2 atmosphere, which isn't like ours, of course, but um, uh, it's like Venus's, okay? So, hmm, suddenly we're the odd one out. Where's this nitrogen and oxygen thing coming from? You know, shouldn't we be CO2 like the other planets? What do we do wrong here, you know? If you were the environmental protection officer about three and a half billion years ago, and you were asked, uh, should we introduce life on the Earth? You would have had to say thumbs down on that one because it's going to radically change the atmosphere into some nitrogen, oxygen weird thing, okay? So um, it happened on Earth, okay? The, fortunately for all of us, the environmental protection officer uh, was on vacation at that time, apparently, and we ended up with what we have now. But the key thing is it's different than what we see on, in fact, uh, Venus and Mars. Well, let's take a look at Mars. What do we see on the surface of Mars? Again, uh, the Soviets were not very successful here. They had a huge number, of, a lot of missions to, to Mars. They had real difficulty with that and have uh, uh, e even, even more recently. Uh, as you know from the Phobos mission, which, couldn't even, which didn't get out of Earth or orbit, sadly, Ph Phobos sample return mission. So the key kind of crown jewel at this point was the Viking missions. Two successful orbiters, two successful landers. And get this, we went into orbit twice around Mars without knowing where we were going to land. You know, this, we, we spend so much time now like worrying about landing sites, which we should, okay? But, you know, when I think back, we spent, you know, like, okay, what are we going to do now? I mean, it wasn't quite like that, but we had to pick the landing site because we didn't have high enough resolution data. Well, let's send a whole package to Mars and we have a camera, let's look and see where to go. It worked, okay? Twice, okay? Um, so this was a hugely successful mission with orbiters and landers, and it was our first view of the surface. I remember sitting with Carl Sagan, watching some of these first color images uh, come down, and <laughs> you know, the, in those days, they came down like like a line at a time. I don't know if anybody remembers that. It's like, oh, agony, you know. So, Carl and I are sitting there watching this line come down, and uh, these lines come down, and uh, there's a rock. I can see a rock, and, uh, and and I'm going, God, my God, Carl, look at this a rock. Look, it's got little pits in it, and. Um, and I'm just getting really excited as a geologist, my first view of the color of the surface of Mars and the rocks. Carl leans back in his chair and he says, Jim, we've just confirmed one of the findings of Paleolithic man. Mars is red. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus! You know, I felt like such a dunce. You know, I'm just looking at rocks. You know, and Carl's really got it. Amazing. Total inspiration of a man. Okay. So, what do we learn from Mars? Okay. Well, if you take a look at Mars, Mars is similar to the Earth and Mercury in many ways. Well, that's not good news. We want something different. We want something halfway between the Earth, uh, and we want something that's got life and so on, okay? The tectonics, no sign of plate tectonics, a one-plate planet like the Moon and Mercury, okay? Significant record of early impact history and volcanism is present in the crust, uh, is preserved in the crust. This thing here is the Hellas Basin, a couple thousand kilometers across, a huge impact into the, into the surface, and lots of other craters here, too. But Mars differs in fundamental ways as well, so there's some hope, okay? Uh, it's not just a boring burnout center, as some people call, I believe it was Carl, actually, who called the moon uh, uh, something like that, but, but very exciting, okay? So what do we know, okay? The difference between 
the Moon and Mercury and Mars, global crustal dichotomy, this big hole in the northern lowlands here, it has these huge topographic rises. I mean, this is uh, several thousand kilometers across, 10 kilometers high, with 25 kilometer volcanoes superposed on top, and a huge rift valley going off the edge here. What the heck is going on in the interior in a planetary body like that? What, you know, you talk about convection. Oh my God, okay? And it's gone on for over three billion years. How do you do that? Something we, you know, you never think about this kind of thing from the Earth, uh, but it's really fundamental. Mars' uh, volcanic activ activity continues up to the present. Doesn't resurface a lot of the planet, but geologically speaking, Mars is volcanically active in the last few millions to tens of million years, and certainly uh, today in the geological sense. Mars is a water planet. It's got rivers, okay? They're dried up now. It's got lakes. They're gone, but they were there. And it's potentially had oceans two times in its history, particularly in the northern lowlands here, okay? Another thing about Mars is we see extreme oscillations in the spin axis orbital parameters. Unbelievable, okay? So Mars' um, spin axis uh, is inclined, uh, much like the Earth's, at about 20 degrees and change, if you will. And um, uh, But because Mars lacks an Earth-sized moon, that tends to stabilize our rotational axis, but Mars doesn't have that. It has a couple of space potatoes, like Phobos and Deimos, kind of like two little moons. And what that means is Mars' um, uh, uh, rotational axis can go up to like 50, 75, 85 degrees. And so, it, okay, imagine. Okay, let's take the polar ice cap and point it to the sun. Things happen, okay? Ice gets redistributed. Perhaps things get melted. Uh, you get tropical mountain glaciers, 170,000 square kilometer tropical mountain glaciers. Bizarre, okay? So lots of really exciting things going on there. Huge magnetic anomalies, um, and an early warm and wet Mars is very likely and a habitat for the formation and evolution of light. So Mars may be the Rosetta Stone of early Earth history in terms of filling in ideas about uh, missing this missing transition. So let's take a look at a little bit at the history of Mars because it's really fascinating. <clears throat> We have three basic periods here, the Amazonian, the Hesperian, and the Noachian, starting, this is the present here. Just in a nutshell, <coughs> excuse me please, the Amazonian is much like um, Antarctica. That's why we go to Antarctica, okay? So it's a hyper-arid, extremely dry, uh, extremely cold climate, okay? So liquid water is in principle not present because it's frozen, if you will. Uh, and so uh, the last three billion years has pretty much been like that. That's why, again, we spend so much time in Antarctica. Mm -hmm. It's amazing to be there for a couple of months a year because you end up, it's like being on Mars every day, except you can breathe, okay? Uh, really fundamental, and the students uh, from Brown, et cetera, we have a field uh, uh, program down there in which we're making measurements to try to understand this majority of Mars history here. But something happened here. Uh, this is when you get these huge outflow channels, if you will. Um, these are... Um, uh, uh, actual floods that have come from the inside of Mars, like the near surface, okay, come up to the crust and flooded across the surface, huge floods, and then ended up in the northern lowlands, which may in fact have been oceans uh, from that activity. And as we go back in time, we see evidence for these um, dendritic valley networks, aka things that look like stream channels that are integrated together and so on, uh, lots of evidence for lakes, etc. And more importantly, we also see evidence for this parallel thing in the weathering. We see clays in this early period, which are good evidence for water-rock interaction. We see sulfates here as it transitions to more Antarctic-like climates. So Mars is an incredible laboratory for the study of the history of climate and the evolution of the planetary climate, you know, from a perhaps Earth-like early history uh, to what we see today, okay? So this is why it's very, very interesting. And when we get back here and we look at this early climate and weathering on Mars, this is a poster from one of the conferences, take a look at these dendritic valleys here. It looks like you're looking at the side of the mountains that were here, something with drainage and so on, except they're dry at the present time. So this is testimony to something that was going on earlier. Not only do we have all these valley networks in the highlands, but each one of these dots, over 230 of them that we've mapped out, um, are in fact what are called open basin lakes. So when a channel flows into one of these craters here, uh, it would be a closed basin lake if it doesn't come out the other side. So it could be water that drained into there, but it just didn't fill it up. But open basin lakes means that it filled up and then flowed out the other side, okay? So that's huge. So this means something is going on for a long period of time here, and these, close, these open basin lakes are the scale of Lake Baikal and the Caspian Sea. These are not trivial little ponds, okay? These are huge, okay? 230 of them, and we're counting more every day, okay? So something's going on here in this period of early 
clay formation that speaks to a warmer, wetter uh, atmosphere. In fact, one of the things we can see in these open basin lakes, this is one of them here, here's a perspective view, here's some mountains over here, here's a couple of channels that are coming down into this, and you can see the drainage network here, and it comes down in and creates deltas right here. They're dried up now, but we can actually go in and look at these in detail. Here's one of the deltas. You can see the bird foot like the Mississippi Delta here. We can actually map the mineralogy of these things. And one of my students, this is this will interest you, uh, he got excited about these deltas and these sedimentary scroll bars. He's now working for Exxon Mobil, okay? I mean, planetary pays off, not for me, but for, for them, okay? So this whole idea here is that you've got this incredible environment, okay? This is where you want to go uh, to look for um, life on early Mars, this kind of environment, and so on. These are the conditions that might uh, exist there. So one of the exciting things is what's going on in early Mars? What's going on with this transition uh, to the sulfates and then on to the current Mars environment? Now, inquiring minds want to know. And so within two weeks here, we're going to be landing on Mars, okay, to address just this question. We're going to be landing in Gale Crater, which preserves a stratigraphic record of the change. Stratigraphic record meaning sediments piled up, okay. We're going to be able to drive right up that boundary between these two geological periods and make sophisticated measurements with this incredible science laboratory. So keep your fingers crossed, going to Mars is not easy, but we have the best possible people in the world working on it at JPL and associated um, universities and federal laboratories that are really going to do the job. So it's going to be very exciting, and I anxiously await uh, this mission, as we all should. Okay, we're lurching towards an end here, okay, working up to um, the largest of the terrestrial planetary bodies relative to Earth, and that would be Venus, okay. So Venus, so here's a big test of what size can do, okay. If we just think about it, well, these other planets, they get rid of the heat very efficiently, the smaller terrestrial planetary bodies. Their surface area to volume relationship, it's like a radiator. You know, when you make a radiator, you make a lot of surface area to get rid of heat fast, okay? That's what a radiator is. Well, small terrestrial planets are excellent radiators. They have a high surface area, so they get rid of heat fast. Their outer boundary layer thickens fast. Uh, the Earth's is not like that, okay? It, it adopted a different way to get rid of heat. And the question is, is Venus going to be like that? We could predict that Venus might have plate tectonics. It might look a lot like the Earth. So these are the kind of questions that compelled us in our in our search for designing missions and so on. Uh, we can portray that here in the geological history of, uh, uh, of the planets here. If you take a look here at this diagram from the present back to the origin of the planets, um, what this plots is the percentage of the surface area created at different times in the history of the planet. So if you take a look at the Earth here, for example, um, we can see that the Earth has two-thirds of its surface created in the last couple percent of the history of the planet, and most of the earlier record is gone. On the other hand, the Moon, Mercury, and Mars, with their essentially solid lithospheres and one-plate planets, uh, preserve the record of what was going on here. This is the very much complementary record that we wanted to find, okay? Well, where's Venus going to fit? Is it going to be like these bodies here, or is it going to be like the Earth, or maybe even something in between? Maybe the key to our understanding of how these planets transition. So this was the quest, if you will, as we looked uh, to Venus exploration. And in fact, the early Venera missions, uh, the Soviets, as I mentioned, landed a series of these missions on the surface. Absolutely fantastic data, got us geochemical information. And their two orbiters, Venera 15 and 16, provided a detailed view of the 20% of the surface in the high latitudes of Venus. And this was followed up with a lot of cooperation with the Russians by the Magellan mission to Venus, uh, which was launched out of the space shuttle in the early 1990s and was a phenomenally successful mission. Now, one of the other people in that class that Tim Much at Brown got excited about planetary science was Steve Saunders, who turned out to be the project scientist for, uh, for Magellan. So um, we were both challenged, and we took different paths but came together on the mission. And this is Ellen Stofan, the deputy project scientist, who was uh, also a Brown graduate, one of my students who's doing really well, proposed a mission to land a sailboat on Titan. We're hoping it gets funded here, okay? <laughs> So what do we find out about Venus? Huge amounts of volcanic activity, okay? If I was depressed about uh, Mercury while waiting to figure out, okay, Venus came through. It's just like a complete volcanological planet. Unbelievable, okay? We managed to see like 85% of the surface of Venus was covered with volcanic deposits. Just to show you here, here's a whole series of lava flows just wallpapering the planet, okay? We were able to because Venus doesn't have, because we're using radar, we can look through the atmosphere, and we had the challenge of essentially an Earth-sized planet 
Well, let's drain the oceans and map the whole planet. It's like saying, okay, your job is to map the Earth in like, well, three or four years, okay? Um, and, you know, we'll just drain the oceans for you. That's essentially what Venus was like, okay? All of a sudden, every day, new data would come down. At the end of the first phase of the mission, we had about 100% coverage of the surface of Venus, and we began mapping, okay? And in particular, uh, Misha Ivanov, one of my colleagues from Bernatsky Institute in uh, uh, Russia, uh, was instrumental in getting together and integrating a lot of these data, and this is a portrayal of his geological map, which was recently published. Uh, it, in fact, it became a global geological map, <clears throat> and this is what we use to decipher the history of Venus. So what does Venus look like? Where does it fit in this context, okay? Well, one of the first things we found out is that the surface, as I mentioned, is predominantly volcanic in origin. There's no ancient heavily cratered terrain. So, okay, it's not like the Moon, Mercury, and Mars. Hey, maybe it has plate tectonics. Maybe it's being recycled in these ways, okay? It has these t terrain called tessera. It's the brown areas here that make up about 12 to 14 percent of the surface of the planet. They look like continents. They're incredibly deformed, thick crust, uh, you know, folds and faults and all sorts of things. So, hey, maybe those are ancient continents, okay? Maybe this 20 percent or 14 percent of the surface of the planet will have a lot of craters on it, okay? Because it'll be the old continental-like stuff. Well, it turned out we could take the number of um, impact craters and, and address that question. Impact cratering is sparse. There's about a thousand craters on the Earth-sized planet. That's not a lot. We can take those craters and do the size frequency distribution and ask for the average age of the planet. It turns out to be less than a billion years. Like, okay, okay, so first thing is, it's young, like the Earth, okay? Um, so let's take a look at this in more detail, okay? Um, the craters are evenly distributed, okay? So if there were plate tectonics, we would expect to be no craters where it's coming apart and a lot of craters where it's coming together or on the continents. But the craters are evenly distributed. The craters are evenly distributed. Okay, so how, how, how does, how's this, how's this working here? This is one of those Tom McGetchen, it's D, none of the above, okay? So if we take a look at this, um, not only does it mean there's no evidence of plate tectonics, but the crater population is very uh, is nearly completely spatially random. Shown in the lower right hand portion of this diagram are six plots. One of them is the actual distribution of impact craters on the surface of Venus. The other five are a thousand points in a random number generator plotted on the surface. <laughs> I'm sure you can all discern which one is Venus, uh, but in fact, you know, you can't distinguish it from just looking at these images alone, okay? So <clears throat> what is going on here, okay? This is a big mystery. So Venus exploration reveal a planetary surface that, like the Earth, has no remaining morphological record of the first two-thirds of the history of the solar system. So Venus actually looks like this. Same age as the Earth's surface, but in fact it looks as if uh, it doesn't have any plate tectonics. So what the heck is going on here? How do you do this? Okay. So it turns out that when we take a look at this, um, not only is it just young, but it looks, remember what I said, you can't distinguish the surface um, from a completely spatially random surface. That means <clears throat> that some areas aren't being uh, created uh, early and then others later to any great degree. It means that the surface had to be resurfaced, all the old craters erased, and then it had to kind of slow down and not, and just be a collector of craters. So, you know, the mystery thickens here. How do you take an Earth-like planet, that would be us, okay, and completely renew its surface over a very short period of time, and then stop, okay? And then maybe there's a little volcanism here and there, but, <clears throat> but not much, okay? So, you know, it, not only is this none of the above, it's kind of scary, actually, when you think about it in the Earth context. So Venus must have undergone a global-scale resurfacing in its recent history, you know, when, <laughs> when we think things should be pretty, pretty mature and heavily evolved by this point, okay? This resurfacing must have been geologically rapid, and what could have caused such a configuration and an event, okay? So this has occupied geologists and planetary scientists for a long time. And we don't know the answer yet, okay? We simply don't know the answer. We're trying to get back to Venus uh, to try to test some hypotheses. One of them is that it's, this is a technical term, <clears throat> a transition from mobile lid to stagnant lid lithospheric regime. What the heck does that mean? It means that the outer layer, like a plate tectonics layer, is roiling away and it's kind of like a mobile lid, and then it kind of freezes up and becomes a stagnant lid, okay? So that's one option, but that doesn't quite fit either for a variety of reasons. Uh, maybe it's episodic plate tectonics. Maybe you get plate tectonics turning on, turning off, turning on, turning off, 
and so on. That doesn't really work either, <coughs> because we should see some evidence of that. The one that's standing out here is what's known as a catastrophic overturn of a depleted mantle layer. What does that mean? Well, if you think about the way the Earth's crust works, it starts at divergent plate boundaries at, at, at mid-ocean ridges and spreads laterally, okay? On the moon, we know the crust is building up vertically. And we look at the moon, we say, yeah, yeah, it's building up vertically. Lavas are coming out, it's piling up on the ancient crust, etc. What we didn't think about before we went to Venus was what happens when you let that go? Okay, so when you pile it up, you create many kilometers thick lava. And at some point, that lava and the material below that lava that it's being extracted from becomes net negatively buoyant, which is another way of saying that it's going to founder down into the interior and overturn. So imagine our surprise when we started thinking about this and realized that, in fact, this resurfacing may come from a complete overturn of the surface of the planet very late in the history of the planet. I mean, this is big news because, by the way, it's an Earth-like planet, okay? So, hmm, you know, I wonder if this could happen to us. <clears throat> so this was really big news. Could similar processes lie in Earth's past or its future? We don't really know, okay? So one of the things we thought here is, and we, that, is that maybe this is how plate tectonics actually starts. So this is one of the interesting perspectives we have, that this kind of overturn could start the subduction process. Nobody knows how plate tectonics started on the Earth. There's some ideas, but there's no consensus about it at all. So this is some insight. It's a little scary. It's why we explore the planets, because we get this. We wouldn't have thought of this at all uh, from the data we have. So if we take a look at this then, in summary, we have a legacy here. The scientific results from exploration really helps us to put the Earth in perspective. I mean, it's just every day, you know, people say, uh, gee, why do we have to go to the planets? And, you know, to say, well, we understand the Earth better by going to the planets. You kind of have to sit them down to explain, oh, so we leave the Earth to understand the Earth. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of like that. And it's true, okay? So we, we get this early part of the history. We can understand the geology and effects of a whole series of different um, planetary environments, and we can indeed look at the evolution and different ways of dealing with these problems, what the role of, of size is, what the role of position in the solar system, how tectonics works, and, and so on. So returning to our own home planet Earth, that would be this one here, uh, we've now got a really good perspective on the missing chapters in the first half of Earth history. We know that impact cratering is incredibly important, a fundamental planetary geological process. We know that the proto-Earth was hit by a huge Mars-sized objects, and that really had uh, set the Earth on a path that it wouldn't have been on otherwise, let alone give us something to look at in the evening sky. Huge impact basins in early Earth history, and throughout history, this impact cratering set of processes was a negative influence on the evolution of the biota. For many years, people said, oh yeah, that extinction in Earth history was due to an impact. Most terrestrial geologists say, oh yeah, right, that's ad hoc or deus ex machina if I've ever heard it. But planetary scientists say, it's not if, it's when, okay? Because you look at the geological record of the planets, it's not if, it's when. It's constant bombardment, okay? It's like global warming. Is global warming gonna occur? The only thing constant is change. You know, Even if there were no humans on the planet, the atmosphere would be changing, okay? Humans are on the planet, the atmosphere is really changing, because we're here, common sense. Just no question about it, okay? So we take a look here. Uh, we also see things like density inversions of internal layers, like on Venus, could have a huge effect. We see that on the Moon, actually, too. It didn't have the same effect, but it's also really critical. Uh, radical climate changes, okay? There was a time, we take a look at the evolution of the Martian atmosphere, we can see huge long-term climatic change. There was a time when Earth was known as a snowball Earth, when it was essentially frozen over, okay? Frozen over, okay? And, and so there are times when there's radical climate change, and we have planetary perspectives on that as well. This also gives us new perspectives on life, in fact, uh, on hospitable environments, okay? We can look at early history of Mars, try to understand what's going on there, look at the perspective in these different environments and think about ways in which might have, life might have formed, form refugia, if you will, gone to when the t going got tough, and in fact, might still be in some of these environments today. So 50 plus years since Sputnik, okay? No longer do we view Earth in isolation. It's now a member of a family of planets. This is the planetary perspective, if you will, so we look at things not as a single body, not in a completely terra-centric view, but in a perspective related to our pl other planets in the solar system and around the sun. And we look to the geological record of these one-place planets to understand what's going on 
uh, in terms of impact cratering with time. We look to Venus to understand how tectonism and volcanic activity uh, might appear during Earth's Archean period billions of years ago. And we can observe the thermal evolution, the temperature-dependent evolution of these things uh, to get an idea of how planets work, when plate tectonics started, how it did, and what this holds for the future of the Earth, too. Plate tectonics is scheduled to stop in about 500 million years by some predictions, okay? Not, not of concern to you or your grandchildren, but, but, you know, some radical changes at that time, okay? Will plate tectonics cease on the Earth, and if so, what will it look like? And then will this Earth's lithosphere, like Venus, undergo catastrophic overturn in the very near future? So in conclusion, from all this, we reach some planetary, comparative planetological themes. So we have a dynamic planet with a record of its formative years erased, uh, but the other terrestrial planetary bodies provide complementary records of this early missing period of history. This has informed us immensely about our own home planet's origin and evolution. We can look to Venus as a laboratory for the study of this vertical crustal accretion, and also the nature of the atmosphere and the evolution of an Earth-like planet. We can look to Mars for a laboratory for this analysis of the atmosphere, the history of water, radical climate change, and conditions that it might have been uh, might have led to life. And within two weeks, we're going to have a spacecraft on the surface which is going to seriously address these kinds of issues in a very short order. Mercury, an end member for testing models of a variety of different things, very unusual planet. The kind of things we're finding out on Messenger are just stunning, and they tell us that our simple models of the changes as a function of temperature and pressure in the collapsing solar nebula are probably not right, uh, and that Mercury may have come from some, somewhere else in the solar system, as a matter of fact. And the Moon, the Moon is really the foundation for understanding fundamental planetary processes. This is why the NASA Lunar Science Institute and the Lunar Science Forum are so important, because in fact, what we're doing here is actually, we have a laboratory. You can see it in the sky. It's within a couple of days, okay, to get there. We can send all kinds of things there. We can learn about this early history, uh, and we can pave the way for our evolution out into the solar system. One of my colleagues, Apollo 16 commander John Young, says in his very dry-witted way, you know, Jim, single-planet species don't survive. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> Th think about that. I mean, he, he knows he's been there. So, <laughs> just finishing up here, I wanted to summarize about these two parallel revolutions. I mean, absolutely an, an amazing thing for me personally to have lived through. And, uh, and, and I, I don't want to hark on the past because it's all about the future. All the young people in the audience, it's all about the future. Uh, and in fact, the questions that we're asking here will be answered by um, humans on the surface of the other planetary bodies and robotic exploration throughout the solar system. Hugely important questions for us to understand. We're learning about these things now because just as I've convinced you in the last 50 years, we've lurched towards an understanding of the Earth in the context of the, of the solar system. We're now making huge daily strides in our understanding of solar systems, of our own solar system, in the context of other solar systems around other stars. Just amazing, okay? So, <laughs> you know, we, we thought, oh, you know, Earth, uh, it's pretty special, uh, you know? Uh, and, oh, oh, yeah, Venus, well, you know, who would want to be there? So, we're so terracentric, it's just obscene sometimes, okay? And the key thing here is that we're the odd thing out. This, our solar system is really unusual. It's kind of like, um, not because of us, I can guarantee you that, but in fact, these other solar systems are informing us immensely. And this is your tax dollars at work again. It's astronomy research, it's planetary science research, and it's paying dividends and understanding how this whole solar system came to be in the first place. So with that, let me conclude and say I really appreciate, again, your tax dollars and your support and your interest. It's an incredible journey. It's just beginning, okay? And the young people in this audience are going to be the ones that take us uh, out to uh, Mars, and I want to see them on Mars in the not-too-distant future uh, so that we can actually reap the benefits of this scientific exploration. Thank you very much. <laughs> Jim, if I could kick off the questions, um, I, was, I was wondering, you, you had three hypotheses for what's happening on uh, Venus there that we have to test. Um, it, don't forget D, none of the well, above. D, right, none of right. the above, yeah. So yeah. Uh, what do you give, uh, or what would you think would be the best uh, way to investigate those three hypotheses with, a, with the next mission to Venus? Yeah, we, we've actually proposed... Um, uh, uh, several missions. Uh, you know, sample return would be really absolutely fantastic because you really want to look at um, the age of the rocks. Uh, you know, like if you go to those heavily deformed areas, you, you can probably get 
the age of the rocks that um, that formed that deformed terrain that were that existed on Venus prior to the time that this event occurred. Um, the other kinds of things that we we need to know are seismology, what the stru internal structure is, and of course um, we propose to. Um, uh, map the surface at even higher resolution so we can see some of these geological relationships that would test would give us some indication of how rapidly these changes take place. So there's a whole bevy of missions that are being worked on now um, with both the Russians and, um, and the US uh, and European colleagues to try to get at some of these issues. Um, I, I think um, more creative thinking would help too. So if anybody in the audience has any ideas, this is the kind of dumbfounding conundrum you know that that just requires new critical thinking. So, uh, you know that 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 would help too. <laughs> Hi, good talk. Uh, for the moon, the the face of the moon, the nice the, the thing that we're all familiar with, mm -hmm. that's only on our side. Right. The far side doesn't have that. Now there is the theory of a secondary impact and all of that. Mm -hmm. How will you check? Is there a way somebody's planning to check the crust or something? Sure, sure. So the, the, the concept is the moon is in, um, is essentially, um, uh, in synchronous rotation. So the near side always, fa it's the near side, okay? It, it, it's always facing us. Um, but there's other asymmetries too. That is, um, you know, you have all the Maria on one side, which I think is what you're referring to there. So, uh, why is that? It, it, it's likely that it's related to both impact cratering as well as, um, crustal thickness. So um, the thickness of the crust, if it's really thick, it takes a, a lot of effort for the volcanic activity to get up through, to push up through and get out on the surface. So when it's a thick crust, like continental crust, you don't have as much volcanic activity as, say, in the ocean basins, et cetera. So how do we test that idea? Okay, well, we have two spacecraft in orbit right now. They're the GRAIL spacecraft, and they're mapping the gravity field uh, of, uh, of the moon in excruciating detail. And we just had a report at the, at the Lunar Science Forum from uh, Maria Zuber, uh, former Brown student who's a professor at MIT who is the principal investigator and um, the, uh, she and Dave Smith showed uh, details and you know it's like stunning I mean really very very high resolution data that are going to let us get at not only the thickness of the crust over the crust as a whole but also related to anomalies within that that, that that will help us provide answers about if that's the correct answer or not so it's a fundamental kind of thing you know um, but probably crustal thickness is, is part of it and we'll be able to test it with the GRAIL mission yeah, so I was under the impression that um, you need oceans to, um, that the oceans provide the water that lubricates mm -hmm. um, continental drift. I mean, maybe you could have plate tectonics without oceans, but it, you know, it, you know, it just would, it would be a lot harder, it would be a lot slower. And, and I, you know, I thought that was why you don't have plate tectonics on Venus, is because, mm -hmm. I, I mean, maybe there was an initial phase and then when it dried up, you know, it, it stopped and then it got paved over. So, I mean, is I, the way you were talking, that didn't seem to be the case. Is, I, am, I, am I mistaken? No, I think, you know, uh, the, certainly on Earth right now, we know that uh, when the plates flex and subduct underneath the continental lithosphere, for example, um, that they carry down water and sediments with them, wet sediments and, you know, saturated sediments. And, and clearly that has an effect on the rheology, which is like the physical properties of the rock materials, its ability to flow and deform, et cetera. So uh, that, that's definitely the case. But um, it's, it's sort of a deductive kind of idea about why we didn't see it, okay, not so much that it can't happen. Okay, so that's the key. So one of the ideas for plate tectonics on Venus is that the, because it's so hot on the surface, I, I failed to mention that it's hot, in, it's like inside of a self-cleaning oven. Okay, not only is it 100 bars, don't, don't perform this experiment at home, but but it's it's really uh, it's really hot, and so that has an effect on the rheology of the rocks as well. So some people think that can offset it; that you actually can pile stuff up and then have the have the sub you know five or ten kilometers down have that subduct. Okay, so there may be some variations on the theme, and I think mostly those arguments are not showstoppers. They're like an attempt to explain why Venus doesn't seem to have plate tectonics. So it may be related to that sort of thing but I don't think it rules it out. It's, it's a really good question, something everybody's looking into, trying to do deformation experiments under Venus conditions. And, and again, that's where the, where the home oven comes in handy. Yes? Uh, I had a question about the atmosphere of Venus. Uh, I think the whole crustal overturn theory is very interesting. And i uh, wondering, you know, how would that affect the atmosphere and what role does the atmosphere play 
uh, in that theory. And it's interesting to think about uh, what the atmosphere would be like prior to such an event. Absolutely. So uh, you can imagine that if you actually have 80% of the surface of Venus uh, resurface by volcanic activity in one of these overturns, that you know clearly molten rock brings up gases from the interior and exhaust them. That is, you know, if you if you've ever seen a volcanic eruption, you're bedazzled, but by the fireworks, so to speak, but it's, it's huge amounts of SO2 and other gases are coming out. So it's going to have a radical effect. It, it, and people are looking at that now. It's like it's, it's going to be really, really significant in terms of the amount. It's like taking the building of an atmosphere and doing it in you know tens of hundreds of millions of years. So absolutely a radical effect. What did it look like before? Well, if you take a look at the themes of planetary evolution in the first four billion years, um, with an Earth-like planet, it's hard not to go through the series of steps that the Earth did. That is to say, to have a lot of volatiles and to, in fact, have an ocean. In fact, from Pioneer Venus data, we know from um, uh, hydrogen deuterium relationships um, that that's, there's evidence for, in fact, water in the earlier history of, of Venus. So it's, it's quite possible that it actually had an ocean uh, during that time period. And then when this event happened, you know the CO2 and you know the the SO2 in the atmosphere, et cetera, uh, were seriously uh, uh, enhanced during that period of time. So that's another period. That's another area of study that's really really critical. So if you have any ideas, let me know. Okay. Hi, over here. Um, I have a, a speculative question. At the very end, you you asked about or you mentioned the extra planet exoplanets, other solar right. systems. And I was wondering if you might have any thoughts based on our highly limited data as to the possible composition of the so-called super-Earths in exosolar systems. Uh, you know, I think we're just getting to the point where we can start looking at the atmospheres. Do you know what I mean? I mean, in fact, today I saw a NASA news brief that said we discovered uh, a new planet that was smaller than the Earth, okay? So that's interesting. I didn't I didn't have time to read the details because it was at this very interesting meeting. I, I was cheating and looking at my email. So uh, <laughs> Yvonne's going to kill me here. I think. Um, you know, I, I think this is where we're heading is to try to get the composition of these things. So you can you can make some arguments about orbits and densities and interactions and things like that. Uh, but the the further we go, the more we'll be able to um, to actually get to the point where we can start looking at the atmospheres of super Earths and even Earth like planetary bodies and. There's some very bizarre things going on now, actually fun for volcanology. I was at the American Geophysical Union meeting this past fall, and uh, one of the scientists reported on this um, this planetary body uh, that was actually one of these planets that was in synchronous rotation uh, to this huge star. And, you know, I'm going, geez, you know, that temperature, it's going to have volcanism on one side. I mean, like, molten. <laughs> and on the other side, it's not. Okay, so... So we're gonna we're working on that right now. He's got all the data about you know the likely temperatures, et cetera, and uh, you know it'd be it would be the Jekyll and Hyde of, of planets. I mean you know like unbelievable. So so you know it's just a I, I would say at this point we're just accumulating huge amounts of information, increasing the technology to get at just the kind of questions you're asking. And personally, there may be people in the audience who work on this that can answer the question. I I just don't know what whether we've been able to actually get. Uh, kind of like a fundamental composition of any of these bodies. Is anybody, any astronomers here that... Well, some planets have iron atmospheres. I like that, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there's a perspective for you. That's great. Jim? Over here. Oh, so. No, no, sorry. Yeah. Okay, sorry, I'm sorry. Are you right? <laughs> Origin of the moon and recent claims that the cataclysmic collision that you talked about mm -hmm. can't be right because mm -hmm. the lunar samples don't have anything except terrestrial materials. Okay, so th this is a good question, and this is the kind of thing where you, um, you know, when, when I was in school and up until the uh, like early part of the Apollo program, uh, there were several theories for the origin of the moon. Capture, you know, kind of like uh, uh, lost from the earth and so on, not through an impact and so on. Um, and uh, uh, this, this hypothesis has pretty much stood the test of time over the last couple of decades, okay? Not without question and attack, for sure. Um, and one of the points was, well, you know, if, if this happened, uh, you know, basically, if you were in the Earth at the time this happened, you would be iron would be good because you'd be breathing silicate liquids. Okay, I mean silicate vapor. Okay, 
So, so the idea was that that was so intense that any volatiles, any, any gases or water or anything like that would be burnt off and whatever ended up in the moon would be completely dry. Okay? So this, I'm coming back to your question in a second. But the point is that, at, you know, and then people in our lab at, at Brown, um, Alberto Saul, uh, made measurements on some of the glasses recently with very high resolution capabilities that we didn't have before and found evidence for significant amounts of water in these glasses from the moon. Um, these volcanic glasses. And so, you know, people, well, that, that just throws that whole theory out. And, well, no, wait a minute, you know, if you have the eject to go out and some of it comes from here and some of it comes there, you know, maybe that's possible. Okay, so it's, it's that kind of thing. People start talking about, um, okay, this throws the whole idea out. And so people go back to their models and say, well, gee, you know, if it's an oblique impact, it would take off the upper part of the Earth's crust blah, 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 and, and, and you know, do some modification. So I, I would say we're in the middle of a, a serious uh, testing of this kind of hypothesis. Um, it would be hard for me to imagine, although not impossible, okay, that, that this wasn't a fundamental part of the issue because of the nature of the, of the similarities between the two bodies, okay, and, and, and some of their mineralogy and composition, and the lack of a competing theory that really helps to explain what's going on. It's really hard to capture a body the size of the moon relative to the Earth. Um, uh, so, so I think probably we're gonna have another decade of fine tuning of that, which will, which will give us a lot of information uh, about how that whole process worked. And, and the process is teaching us huge amounts about how the solar nebula formed in the first place. Because the same kind of situation, you know, the sequestration of volatile materials, uh, you know, the temperature dependence of silicates and how it all accretes together, all of these things are fundamental to our understanding of how the basic processes of planetary formation occur. So, uh, you know, maybe it'll get thrown out, but I think it's more likely to be, oh yeah, okay, no, can we accommodate that? For example, early on, um, people said, oh, you know, I think this meteorite might be from Mars. And the impact cratering people said, there is no way that you can launch a rock off Mars and have it come to the Earth. No way, okay. So, well, yeah, yeah. So then we started making more measurements and people started looking at, you know, comparisons to Viking gases in the rock and more and more. And finally, it's like, these rocks are from Mars. Okay, let's just see now. Maybe if it's an oblique impact and it's going, you know, and so they figured out a way to do it, okay. So, yeah, you know, I'm not belittling this because you, you have to start with models, you have to try to, uh, you know, but, but it's a series of successive approximation in the different disciplines, geology, geophysics, cosmology, etc., they're all working, you know, to try to look uh, at different perspectives. And when you work together, you you, you can you know, you get to fine tune these things uh, towards a, a better approximation of reality. So that's how I see the process at the moment. Does that does that make sense? She's skeptical. <laughs> yeah, I have a question about Venus. Uh, so you have this massive atmosphere about 100 times that of the Earth, and this huge temperature, it's almost glowing red. Do you have a favorite view of how it got to be that way? Um, I, I think this late stage event could, could have a huge effect there. Uh, you know, I'm not an atmospheric um, dynamicist or, or chemist, so I'm a little uh, rusty on the details there, but but I think this whole overturn event where, as you were saying, you know, it puts a huge amount of gases in the atmosphere uh, must have had a huge effect. Um, and I think that's, a, that's an area of study that people are working on now. So I, I kind of like stay tuned for, for more recent information on that. But, um, you know, it, it's very clear that once you get this kind of like CO2 atmosphere, the, the actual greenhouse effect can just come normally, okay? So you get a certain, so it may have been that way for, it may have evolved that way even before this as well. So, I mean, we, we know how that works, so the physics are pretty clear. So. Uh, from ours, you mentioned that uh, it might have had oceans two times. I think right. you heard said mm -hmm. that. Can you go on about that? Sure. So the first time is um, in the uh, earliest period of Mars history, the Noachian period. So if you have all this runoff, all these open basin lakes, and they're all heading downhill. Downhill is the northern lowlands. And the, the problem is that the northern lowlands had been resurfaced by volcanic activity in the middle Mars period, the Hesperian. And so where you would expect to see the evidence, you know, it's just covered up, okay? So that's um, uh, unfortunate. Um, and there's a debate about how much water is actually existent. Okay, no question about these open basin lakes and the volumes there. 
But the question is, how long did that go on, and was it enough to create a northern lowland ocean? We can look at drill holes through impact craters, and the uh, planetary mineralogists have done this, and they don't, they don't see a lot of evidence for distinctive clays from these impact craters that might indicate, or variations that might indicate an ocean was there, okay? Um, so it's a, it's a debate right now. I, you know, I, I don't think we have clear evidence. Many models just, it's a fundamental prediction, but, but the evidence we haven't, I think, confirmed that at all. The second would be when these huge outflow channels form. Now, how do you get outflow channels coming out of the subsurface? How do you get water coming out? It turns out that Mars is so cold at this point that it has a globally continuous ice layer. So the water builds up underneath, and then it, a crack happens, maybe a volcanic eruption, and the water just pours out, okay? Um, and huge amounts. I mean, we can see these hundreds of kilometers wide, hundreds of meters deep, teardrop-shaped, hydrodynamically affected islands, and it's all heading downhill to the northern lowlands. And I think that's the best bet right there, evidence-wise, because we do see evidence for alteration and modification that could be related to that period. If it happened in the present atmosphere of Mars, it wouldn't stay that way very long. I mean, we're not talking beach balls and cabanas here, because <laughs> what happens is it's so cold that it freezes, and then it sublimes and goes back to the poles. So it might have been of the order of thousands, maybe millions of years. Um, if, if it wasn't replenished, it would probably freeze up and then uh, essentially get recycled to the poles. So that's another thing we're looking at with atmospheric modeling. Okay. Uh, back in the 70s, uh, there was a, a Viking lander that seemed to have detected the evolution of oxygen. Mm -hmm. And it turned out not to be so, but, uh, but there was a lot of excitement about life and so on at right. that time. Mm -hmm. What was the explanation of the evolution of oxygen? Oh, Lord. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. It's always the last question, you know? <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, so I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put this in a broader context because I actually can't remember exactly what happened with that experiment. But there's a lot of unusual chemistry on Mars that is not necessarily, for example, with the um, Phoenix lander, uh, they detected perchlorates, which is not your common day-to-day -day kind of thing you'd think about. Um, so there's some unusual chemistry going on related to the atmospheric environment and, you know, radiation, incoming radiation, et cetera. And my recollection is that it was basically something like that. It was something where you, um, you would generate, um, uh, you, you know, you would expect the oxygen to be some kind of like uh, evidence of life, but it was a non-biological process that was mimicking it. And I honestly, I'm sorry to say, I can't remember exactly what that was. So. It, but, but I have three or four students here. Does anybody remember? Will, where are you? There you go. All right. <laughs> uh, Jim, um, we have a uh, special Are We Alone mug. You mentioned that you were fond of mementos. Hopefully, we can uh, find evidence of this in your uh, office at Brown oh, at some yeah. stage in the yeah. future. Perhaps not for four billion years, but um, as long as it lasts. <laughs> Thanks, you, thank, thank you very much. And I, I have to say that I collect beer bottles. And so if you go to my website, you'll see uh, the collection. And I will fill this with beer and, and put it on the shelf. <laughs> That's fantastic. Please, please join for, me in thanking perhaps you. Perhaps this evening. I don't know. What are the plans? Like? Thank you very much.